Hi, this is Brian Q. Miller, and you're listening to The Nerd by Word. Ladies and gentlemen, we're back from outer space. We just walked in to find you here with that glad look upon your face because it's a brand new episode of the Nerd Byword. I'm Dave, here with fellow nerd Chris, and we're bringing you a new episode that hits all your favorite things. Video games, movies, television, and comic books. We also have a special guest with us today. He's written for television series uh, like Smallville and Sleepy Hollow and Shadowhunters, writer Brian Q. Miller. But first, Chris, nerd news, go. Um, the New Mutants. I mean, this this is the the film that just won't stay dead and just won't be released. But um, at Comic Con at home panel, they had the cast um reveal like extended footage and like the first scene of the film, and it was amazing. It was incredible. If you haven't seen it, go check it out. You see the opening scene where Danny Moonstar Mirage like wakes up out of like this nightmare and into a waking nightmare, and it's the demon bear. You get the full demon bear from the Claremont Sinkevich. Like it is everything that a comic book lover, a new mutant fan, could hope for. And by God, I demand this film be released in some format, whatever. Like the twenty, the twenty-five dollar thing that I proposed a couple of weeks ago. I'll pay twenty-five dollars right now to see this movie, based on what I just saw. I mean, Magic is a fan favorite for mutant fans, and Anya Taylor Joy. So what? What we've seen so far, she looks like everything as advertised as Ilyana Rasputin. Amazing. Maisie Williams looks incredible as Wolfsbane. Like, and my personal favorite new mutant, um, Roberto da Costa, I need some sunspot. So this movie needs to come out. Now this movie's been delayed. It was originally supposed to be coming out April the 13th, 2018. That was delayed, uh, February 22nd, 2019. So it wouldn't, you know, coerce with the Deadpool 2 release. Then they moved it to August 2nd, 2019 to avoid Dark Phoenix, which we don't even talk about that movie. That's the unspoken. Um, and then it was delayed to April the 3rd, 2020, when Disney acquired Fox. Um, and then it was delayed due to the pandemic. And now it's just this circus show. But I need to see this movie, please. I need to see this movie. Josh Boone looks like he knows what he's doing. He looks, I mean, the opening um the opening sequence the opening um you know monologue by Danny um is directly pulled from Claremont's script this movie looks like it's everything we hoped it would be but i need to see this movie dave yeah so i i have to admit that i uh, watched the footage and i am intrigued the, the movie looks like the love child of x men and stranger things and i can really see this working it's just so sad that this is basically the last uh quote-unquote X-Men movie that Fox produced and it's been through this huge troubled development and and reshoots and Disney's acquisition of Fox and COVID like it's this never-ending barrage on this poor movie it's it's an underdog at this point and I want to like it I hope I will it's it's definitely the underdog right now um but I'm cautiously optimistic based on the footage I've seen that this could be something uh, really special. Yeah, I'm just like, it's it's funny that you recommended that um, Nightmare on Elm Street, you know, documentary, and I talked about what a chicken I was when it comes to horror movies, but there's definite like horror vibes in this film, and maybe this is the thing that helps me cross over, because I love New Mutants, I love all mutants of all ages, um, and whether they're new or old, I love mutants. Uh, fans of our show know that very well. So if this gets me to cross over into the horror genre by, by bringing it here, you know, maybe that's a good thing. But I really just hope that this gets released. Now, I just looked, um, and it looks like uh, there's something contractual where it cannot be released digitally first. 
So that doesn't exactly fill me with hope, but I really want to see this movie. Um, but yeah, speaking of COVID, uh, Dave, something uh, you're sharing with us has uh, you know similar lineups there too. What you got? Yeah, so Kotaku reported on August 1st that video on social media appeared to show Call of Duty Modern Warfare players gathering in person during an amateur tournament Uh, American Gaming Network's Indianapolis Open, despite the event officially being moved online due to concerns over COVID-19. AGN Indy was supposed to be the first American LAN tournament hosted during the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, Players were uh, supposed to have worn face masks, organizers said the event would conduct temperature checks, and sign-up even included a COVID-19 liability release waiver. And then... uh, The night before the tournament, AGN announced that it would just be online only instead. Uh, The wrinkle in this story is that the day of the event, video started circulating on Reddit and Twitter, supposedly showing tournament participants gathering to play matches in person. Now, at the time of this recording, this seems to be still kind of uh, be a developing story. Um, And I'm sure there's plenty of uh, gaming reporters looking into uh, this right now to find out exactly what happened. But I just wanted to say, as as sort of a thing with this story, there's a reason we sign off each episode with stay well and stay nerdy. In in these trying times, it's important we take care of ourselves and each other. COVID-19 is really no laughing matter. More than 150,000 people have died of the virus. And so my fondest wish for the nerd community right now is that we continue to enjoy our nerdy passions in a safe way, both for ourselves and for others. Chris, what are your thoughts? Yeah, this I, this blew me away. I couldn't believe it when I read it. Um, you know, the, the, there's a lot of irony going on here. You know, most of the time when you think of someone playing Call of Duty, they're online and... Um, you know, they're they're alone in their own home or maybe they have a friend over or something. But for them to go out of their way to, you know, show up in person to, you know, a game that's usually played separately online. It's just like, it's, it's unfortunately, it's a microcosm of, you know, what's happening all too often across the United States of people that are thumbing their nose um, at this pandemic and, you know, the, the safeguards and the guidelines that have been set in place by health professionals on, on what the best practices are. You know, I read a report a couple of weeks ago that if everyone were to wear masks, um, COVID projected could be projected to be under control in four to eight weeks. We're well past that amount of time that we've been in quarantine simply because people refuse to follow those guidelines. So, I mean, it's, it's not... I don't think it's something ridiculous to say, you know, just, to, and, and I feel like this is, uh, the biggest problem is selfishness and people care about what they want and what they want to do. I want to play Call of Duty um, and I want to do this and I want to show up to this tournament. I signed up for it. I paid for it. And, you know, to hell with everybody else's feelings and, and, and health, you know? So it's just really unfortunate. And, and it has also probably we've kicked this around a couple of episodes, you know, that toxicity of online gaming. So it's unfortunately, it's not surprising to see a bunch of, you know, online gamers throw caution to the wind like this and risk other people's health just because they want something and, and they're not going to be denied. Yeah. Ultimately, um, as I said, you know, we, we, the nerd community has grown and changed a lot over the years. I remember well a time uh, when being a nerd was uh, considered a bad thing. Uh, we definitely are having our cultural moment right now. Um, let, let's close ranks and take care of each other. Now, after a quick break, we'll be joined by comic book and television writer Brian Q. Miller. Stick around. We'll be right back. <laughs> And we're back. Today's Byword Big Talk features special guest Brian Q. Miller. He's written for television series such as Smallville, Arrow, Flash, Sleepy Hollow, and Shadowhunters. He also had a memorable run on D- at DC Comics where he wrote Smallville Season 11 and Batgirl. Brian, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you for having me, guys. So as comic book fans, we're all about a good origin story. 
So we were wondering, what first got you interested in writing? Um, I mean, I didn't have comics really as a as a go to when I was growing up. Like, I had maybe one or two. I was tweeting with somebody about it. I think a couple weeks ago or last week, um, there was a big uh, Hulk Batman like special that was like a large format special um, where they both fought the Joker. Like that was, I think, probably the only comic I had for a very long time. Um, and then I must have at some point had the Superman. There was a large format Superman Spider-Man um, of the same you know, style. Um, and I assume through the same contractual crossover thing. But um, that, that was kind of all I had, like aside from Super Friends and stuff that was on TV. So you know, as as the writing bug kind of got me in, you know, high school and college, and I was working on prose and eventually got into TV, um, I found my way, uh, well, gosh, even before that, um, comics really, having them at the ready. Uh, I worked at a bookstore for, uh, for, God, almost five years when we moved to L.A. And uh, on my lunch breaks, we had a spinner rack. So I would just sit down with a spinner rack and be like, what are these things they call comic books? <laughs> and so um, just read a, read a bunch of stuff. Like I want to say, gosh, what was it? Um, New Frontier had just come out. And so that's like my go-to. That's my, that's, that's so solid. Um, but also like at the same time, it was Infinite Crisis, I think, was the big event on the, uh, on the DC side. And I think maybe Ultimate Spider-Man was rolling out, or Ultimate Fantastic Four. I think it might have been Ultimate Fantastic Four. That was another one of my ways in. But I just kind of ended up getting into comics backwards like that. And so then we also had at the store, shit, like shelves. There was a giant like manga aisle that also had you know a paltry selection of graphic novels by comparison. But um, if you could wade past the manga kids and get to that shelf, you could get to the graphic novels that were on the shelf. Um, and so just kind of caught up on a bunch of stuff uh, that way as well. Um, so that's kind of how I got into the reading of it. Then writing wise, uh, we had Jeff Johns come on and do a Smallville. And so I just kind of picked his brain while uh, while he was hanging out for a couple of weeks. And, uh, the, you know, the rest, they say, is history. He told me who to talk to and, you know, who I who I should get to know. And, and I was in the right place at the right time after that. Now, speaking of, of Smallville, you began work there as an unpaid intern and over time worked your way up to executive story editor. Can you tell us a little bit about your experience working on that show? Uh, yeah, no, it was great. Um, by the time I got there, because I started as an intern in season five, uh, by the time I got there, it was already kind of a, a machine at that point. Like There was already a production in Vancouver. There was already, um, you know, a pretty established writer's office in L.A. So there wasn't a lot of, you know, lots of shows of drama in their early years where people are kind of egos bristle and there's a dog pile for responsibility and for accountability and uh, respect. And all of that was done by the time I got there. So it was very much I likened it to like a teaching hospital. Like it was very much here's how TV works. Intern, would you like to come sit in the room? Come sit in the room and see how we break a story. Go sit and post and see how we edit an episode. Like there was a lot of learning through osmosis while I was, you know, running errands and destroying scripts and getting coffees and all that stuff. Um, and then uh, did a good job with that. So then when there was an assistant opening in a, in season seven, um, I slid up into one of those positions. So it was um, it was good. It was very welcoming and clearly welcoming enough for me to stay there for a few more years after that. So but I, I learned a lot over there. They were really good folks. Now, Smallville famously had the no tights, no flights rule. Since then, uh, you've written episodes for both Arrow and Flash. What do you feel has been sort of the biggest change in the superhero television landscape since Smallville? Marvel? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I mean, I think it's, it's a confluence of things, like all at the same time. Like I joke about the Marvel, but I'm, I'm kind of serious about the Marvel, but... Um, we had, you know, and it was very hard for us to pull off towards the end of Smallville. We did start doing, you know, we had done like little versions of like a quasi costume or getting the symbol onto Clark's chest. Um, but like by the time we hit was when Jeff came back for the second time, by the time we hit the Justice Society in like a two parter in season nine, like, you know, fate was dressed as fate. Like we had Icicle, we had Stargirl, like it was pretty brazenly 
um, you know, under the guise in the story of a forgotten era, a golden age of heroes who felt more comfortable dressing up in costumes than the current kids do. Um, but it was that was kind of our way into getting that for the show. And then into season 10, we were able to because we had taken that risk, which worked out. Um, you know, and nobody caught fire, nobody exploded, you know, people's televisions didn't murder them. Um, you know, we were able to, we did Booster Gold, we did, some would say a less than successful version of Blue Beetle, but we tried, guys. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it, versions, you know, of, you uh, probably more successful than Deadshot, but we, we at least tried. And so I think it plus, um, kind of the, the the Marvel template of embracing what what hero media is and that kind of corner of the genre, um, I think kind of paved the way for, you know, shows like Arrow and then Flash to kind of, you know, pick it up and run with it. Ironically, with those shows too, over in that sphere, um, the wackiest of them all, which, you know, which I love, and I say wacky not in a bad way, but like Legends has the least amount of costume use of all the shows. Um, so it's just it's just interesting to see that the more grounded stories now happen over kind of in that DCEU TV universe where the costumes are involved and the least grounded of the stories now happen on a time traveling spaceship where nobody wears costumes really. And then when they do, it kind of seems really out of place. Like when Nate suddenly turns metal, you're like, wait, oh, that's right. You do that. That's that's weird. OK. Um, but it's, uh, I think it's, I think it's interesting. It certainly makes for more, more dynamic TV. I think, you know, everybody's worried about it looking like Power Rangers, I think to an extent, whenever it happens. Um, but then you watch Power Rangers and you're like, especially now Power Rangers, you're like, okay, well that, it, it all kind of is pretty on par. Like I wouldn't, I wouldn't get judgy if something looked a little bit like that, but it's, it's just time. It's just, you know, media changing over time. Now, there was a bit of a mixed reception among fans regarding the finale of Smallville, since Tom Welling never wore the full Superman costume. In retrospect, do you feel like that was the right decision? What? I've never heard such a thing. No. Um, <laughs> that's balderdash. Um, you know, those were decisions that were uh, above my pay grade. Um, you know, what I, what I can respectfully say is that not everyone involved in those decisions getting made wanted things to turn out like they did. So it wasn't for lack of trying. There were just certain things uh, uh, and uh, that conspired, I guess, to to not have it come to pass. So we were able to pull off as much Clark in the suit as we could, which was about an inch tall on a very big TV from far away if you squint. But uh, but there's at least a little bit of a flap of a cape over his shoulder, I guess, when uh, when he's at Air Force One looking through the window. So... Uh, we, we, we tried our best. We valiantly attempted it, but you know, that we got as far as we did with the, you know, the logo on his shirt when he had his dark kind of trench coaty outfit in season nine, you know, that was a victory for us, um, getting him, you know, into the red zip up jacket that kind of united to form the S like that was a big victory for us in season 10. Um, so, so we, you know, we take, take what victories we can get with that one, but, uh, at least we got to keep going with the comics. So in a way, we got to see him in a costume, just not in live action. Now, while Smallville was still on the air, uh, you wrote your first arc for DC Comics, which was, I believe, Teen Titans 72 through 74. Um, the Teen Titans themselves are incredibly beloved property and have you know, had multiple incarnations, a cartoon that was highly successful, the current DC Universe show. What was that experience like, jumping into really a book that had been running for a long time and getting to put your stamp on it? It was terrifying. Um, it, was, it was absolutely terrifying. Um, Jeff had suggested that I just, he gave me some names, you know, just people to get to know, you know, and then he's like, you know, what you should do is, you know, talk to these guys. I, I forget it was, oh my God, whose names were, it was Dan DiDio and then, um, Oh my God, I'm blanking on the other name, but, um, you know, go, go to the, go to the con and just meet them after one of the panels. And so I was like, the, you mean the New York con that's in like five days? And he's like, yeah, you should go. You should go and totally check them out. And I'm like, we're in LA. It's so like, yeah, sure. Okay. Mr. Johns, I'll go check it out. And so I like put on my big boy pants and just like, you know, blind leap of faith, just like on a dime, you know, went out to New York and, you know, was fortunate enough to be able to get a badge because of, like, of some Warner Brothers connection. Um, 
and did exactly what he suggested and stayed and met some folks. And they were, I assume, impressed that I came all the way out <laughs> on a dime to say hello and said, you know, let's let's talk about some stuff next week. And so, uh, gosh, who was it? Brian Cunningham, I think, was my editor on that run. We, You know, we talked um, a couple weeks after that. And uh, I just kind of stepped into it. But, yeah, it was you know, not knowing, especially because comics have that delay between, you know, when you're writing – and when it comes out, because it takes an incredibly long time to make a comic book um, with just all the different phases. So I forget where they were, but the roster of Titans they handed me to play with in my arc was not who was currently on the shelf. So I was like, oh, God, what's happening? What's coming? Um, and so but it was you know doing the best to make a self-contained story. There was some shifting sand stuff because I think Robin – was going to be leaving the team. So I didn't have access to Robin, but was supposed to tie back up with him at some point. But while I was doing my three issues, they changed what was going to be happening with Robin. So then some others, like it, it was, it was a lot of that kind of stuff in just trying to coordinate with some of the other, I guess, you know, young justice and younger Gotham titles at the time. Um, but it was, um, it was a blast. It was, I'm, I'm, you know, I killed somebody in it. I'm sad uh, that that's kind of what was advertised because I think the cover for my final issue was like, one will die. I'm like, oh, well, that's not what it's about, guys. <laughs> um, it's not like, I'm not approaching it as like a snub thing. It was just, it was, there was a heroic sacrifice and that was on purpose. But, um, but yeah, that's, yeah, and a comic script too is, um, you know, they're, they're their own creature. Like I, I, I asked Cunningham at DC, I was like, so do you have, you know, some that I can look at? Because like I know prose and I know how to write TV stuff, but what does is, what is a comic script look like? And he's basically, just write it however you want. We'll figure it out. I'm like, oh, okay, sh sure. Okay, so I, you know, I went online. I think I found some of, um, I don't remember if Dwayne McDuffie was, was alive or if he had passed away at the time, but he, he, he had a, a repository, which I think is still online of um, just comic scripts from different writers, like a database, like an archive. And so I kind of took bits and pieces from a few different ones that I read and just kind of came up with uh, my own, you know, comic style that I would refine as I went. Uh, I'm doing more and more comics, uh, but that's kind of how all that got started. Now, every week um, we have nerd commendations where we take a comic book uh, that we're reading or uh, a video game that we've been playing and we recommend it to our audience. And our first ever episode was Dave recommending your, your uh, Stephanie Brown Batgirl. So Teen Titans. Yeah. So Teen Titans led directly into that um, Batgirl starring Stephanie Brown, who had previously been a supporting character in Robin and Batman as the spoiler um, so, so Dave is a huge fan. We don't have to advertise this for him anymore, but what to you is the appeal of that character? Well, thanks Dave. Um, it's nice to know that Dave is a big fan. Um, no, I kid. Um, <laughs> um, no, like Steph is, um, uh, I think I, we just had a, a comic con at home, a bad girls panel with me and a few other writers from different Batgirl properties on it. Um, one of the big things we talked about, which was interesting to hear, you know, we, we talked about Cassandra Kane and we talked about, you know, Barbara, obviously, and then and then Stephanie. And what kind of became the recurring theme was resilience, which was interesting because we hadn't planned on that. We just all we were describing our characters like, oh, well, she's, you know, she's, you know, Cassandra's the, you know, strong. She's the strong one. And she's, you know, she's the tough one. And Barbara's the one who's see the most shit and then stephanie's the one who's trying to prove herself but the one thread that kind of comes along with the cape and cowl in a weird way was resilience because they're all they each in their own way kind of use their position as a legacy character to pick themselves back up from something um and so you know for stephanie who had been um you know it's not a judgment on any any prior writers but just as a character she like she been through some pretty rough stuff and thrown away a bit literally and figuratively, um, you know, in earlier titles. And she kind of, I think, needed a bit of, you know, pulling herself up by her own bootstraps and saying, this is why I deserve to live and exist as a character. And so um, that's kind of the angle we took with her of just, you know, realizing, yes, I've made mistakes, but I'm not going to let that define me for the rest of my life. I'm going to go out and do good with the kind of second chance that I've got. So that was that was kind of the the nut around which we we grew the tree of, of Stephanie. 
You know, and it, at the time, reading it as it was being released, it felt like so many comic books had a really, you know, a dark undertone. Even like when you were talking about your Teen Titans issues being advertised as somebody dies, there was sort of a darkness in, in the books at the time. And so Batgirl, to me at least, came across as a real breath of fresh air, something that was uh, d deeply optimistic, really, in, in a time period where a lot of comic books at DC weren't. So that was in, in large part the appeal to me at the time. Well, I think with that, with that too, like th there are a lot of, and it's not, I think it's just part of the climate. It's not a thing like, you know, our Batgirl run paved the way for this, but it's interesting from that point. And, and Sterling's, Sterling Gates is run on Supergirl similarly, not, not the exact same tone as our Batgirl run. She was a little burdened with, with some other baggage, but um, you know, when you look at uh, Kamala Khan, coming up after that over in uh, Miss Marvel and, you know, Squirrel Girl and then over on the DC side, eventually coming back around to Batgirl of Burnside. Like there, I think the Stephanie that we were doing would probably be more at home set against the current comics environment than she was when we were trying to, to, you know, make fetch happen back then. Yeah, I can totally see that. Now the central relationship of your Batgirl run was really between Stephanie and previous Batgirl, Barbara Gordon, who at the time was still in a wheelchair and, and operating as Oracle, which is a very popular incarnation of that character. But since then, Barbara has returned to the Batgirl role herself. As a writer, which incarnation of the character do you feel works best? Uh, Barbara as Oracle or Barbara as Batgirl? Barbara as... It, it's interesting, because I feel like the the easiest my knee jerk answer is oracle um but i think it's not mutually exclusive to how she functioned as oracle like i think in a legacy character kind of way barbara in a mentor position uh you know kind of using her knowledge and her experience um you know whether that is from the viewpoint of you know she now is in a wheelchair because of the killing joke, or even if she were not, um, but using kind of her worldliness and what she learned to imbue, you know, the next generation of, of Batgirl, um, I think would be uh, an ideal use for her, not just because I wrote her as a mentor figure, but um, she, she took to it very well. I mean, even like with the birds, when she pulled birds of prey together before that, um, you know, Oracle, sees all and helps with all. Um, but, um, you know, even with her resilience aside, there's something very nice, uh, in a non, uh, non maternal way with Barbara kind of teaching, um, the next group of, of young heroes, how to be that, um, I think is nice. Cause it's not, it's not as, oh gosh, like, like Batman with the outsiders. Like it's not as, um, not that he ever really like, led them led them that's kind of his mercenary team but you don't get to see kind of the the older generation do it in a way that's fun nurturing and, yeah nurturing yeah like it, w without having to be any kind of like den mother vibe um you know without without being naggy um kind of that big sister vibe i think is um different and not something we see enough of like i imagine Something similar might occur if Wonder Woman were to shepherd like a younger team at some point. Like if Wonder Woman were the mentor to Young Justice or something, there would be something instructive yet nurturing about that as well. Now, your run on Batgirl ended after 24 issues in the lead up to DC's New 52 reboot. What were your feelings regarding having to say goodbye to the character and the notion of that reboot? Uh, you know, not great. But but here's what I will say. Here's what I will say. Unlike many other people who were writing on books at the time, I at least got a heads up. So I had at least two issues to kind of start rewiring the machine to build towards an end that I would be happy with and hopefully fans would be happy with. Um, a lot of people were just like, thanks for playing. And that was it. And they were done. Um, so so I at least got to give Steph kind of the the, the goodbye sentiment I wanted, I wanted her to have uh, on the way out the door. But, you know, of course you're so, I'm super into it. I was devastated. I, there's not a day that goes by that I don't think about writing that character. It, it, it literally is something I think about every day. 
you know, it was interesting at, at that last issue. Uh, it it really packed quite a punch, uh, because there was so much um there on the page, like those glimpses of a possible future. It almost felt like you were kind of laying out your look. This is what you're missing out on, or something. <laughs> what? <laughs> no. What? Um, but it it was. Uh, it was a love letter to all the adventures she she could have had and still may have had because again at the time um, I didn't know what was coming next because I wasn't involved in New Fifty Two I wasn't involved in the reboot so because I wasn't already on the inside they and I wasn't writing the book anymore they weren't going to tell me because I kept like do I need to do this do I have to get her out of the cowl do I have to get her into the cowl like do I have to move Barbara to something like and there were no answers that would come my way. Um, I don't know if they knew or they didn't know at that point, but um, it was one of those things where in in lieu of having directive on how to line things up, I just went ahead and you know wrapped it up uh, how I wanted it to be wrapped up for her. Now, while um, the New 52 was altering and reinterpreting Superman, uh, in some cases in pretty radical ways, uh, for example, with Grant Morrison's run, you were writing Smallville Season 11, and, and that book felt in a lot of ways like classic Superman. How did that whole situation come about, and what were your goals with that series? Um, I'm trying to think how it came about. I feel like it was one of those things in passing, like just with an editor. It might have been with Jeff. Um, it might have been with an editor in passing, cause, because Batgirl was winding down, and I know it was during the kind of the, the the last days of Smallville, at least on the on the writing side, when in passing I had mentioned to someone, I'm like, you know what we should do? Like, they're making that Buffy comic. Like, we keep this going. We should make a Smallville comic. And then I heard nothing for like seven months. And then got a sudden, you know, email from DC Digital that was like, hey, so we were thinking. I'm like, well, holy shit, me too. Um, and so it kind of, uh, uh, kismet kind of worked out that way. Uh, but goal wise was just to, you know, kind of fill in the blank for the for the show because there's that time jump at the very end of the finale where, you know, you're seven years later and then he's been Superman for a bit and kind of the exciting thing from working on the show was, you know, how does he handle that first year? You know, what's his year one story as that Superman? Um, and so that was that was kind of the the allure for me, not just getting to keep playing in that sandbox, but also getting to do stuff and bring in characters that we never could have done on the show. You know, we got to do Batman, Wonder Woman, and Green Lantern. We got to have all that fun um, that never in a million years could we have worked, you know, into the show on for budget reasons, for permission reasons, for any of that. So it was also a chance to, you know, I got to write a Batman story. I got to write a Green Lantern story. I got to write, you know, a, an Olympian Wonder Woman story. Um, it was It was a very fun way to get to play with some different toys in the DC box as well. Now, Stephanie Brown fans are notoriously passionate about the character. Um, just a peek behind the scenes. So Dave texted me today. He said, I've got an idea for an episode. We give each other assignments. Go figure. Two teachers are going to give each other assignments. Um, uh, we're going to give each other uh, assigned like comic book runs um, that, that the other one has to read, and then we'll talk about it for an episode. I was like, it's great. He's like, I already have your assignment. It's Stephanie Brown Batgirl. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, so so Stephanie Brown fans are passionate. Uh, there was quite a bit of rumbling in that fandom when DC announced that you would be including her uh, as Batman's partner Nightwing in the Smallville comics. But by the time the book hit print, Nightwing was Barbara Gordon. So what happened with that? Uh, I was told that uh, she couldn't be Steph. So that I mean that's that really was the beginning and the end of it. There was just uh, a lunch with an editor who said this comes from above. Um, you know, it has to be Barbara. It can't be Stephanie. I was like, as Nightwing, it has to be Barbara as Nightwing. And they were like, look, it just it it, it has to be, it can't be Stephanie. So I was like, okay, well, maybe it could be somebody else. Like maybe we could make somebody up. I'm like, no, like I'd rather it just be Barbara, and then we can do that as a nod to you know Dick Grayson, and eventually in the comics we got her around to you know mentioning Dick Grayson as someone she was dating. So in a weird way, you know, he can inherit Nightwing from her. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it was, you know, uh, not much of a scramble on my end. I, you know, I wasn't too far in some, I think coloring, 
um, was done on a few issues. And so they had to make some changes to her hair. And I think we changed the color of her costume a tiny bit. I think a cover, I think a cover made its way out for solicits that had um, blonde hair on Nightwing, I think. So that, I think, caused some of, some of that, uh, some of the rumbling that you, uh, that you mentioned. But, um, but yeah, it didn't, it didn't change too much. It was, it was a chance to, like, the, um, the silver lining for me on that was it was a chance to do a spin on Barbara being a little more young and enthusiastic and accepted as Batgirl, kind of as Batman's first partner, like instead of having a Robin precede her. So I think for me, it was interesting once I got over, um, you know, my mourning period for not being able to have Steph proper, um, but kind of just getting into that version of Barbara Gordon was, was interesting for me. Yeah. I, I remember reading the book at the time it was released and thinking, well, this, this reads a lot like Steph, that young can do <laughs> attitude. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Um, now, since the end of Smallville season 11 at DC, most of your work has been really on television screens and not in comics. Was that a conscious decision on your part? And if given the chance, would you be interested in returning to comics? I would always love to do more comics. I mean, I think the it's a, it's a what do you call it, a cost-benefit analysis kind of thing. It takes, you know, it, it's not like TV doesn't take a village, but it takes a lot of time to write comics. Um, like I'd liken it to, you know, uh, the closest thing I could liken it to, honestly, is doing animation right now, which which I'm doing some work on. Um, and just the amount of time it takes between, you know, when you write it versus, you know, when you get to see anything versus when it comes out. Um, and, you know, you can, I've been very fortunate to kind of towards the end of the comic stuff. I did some, um, I did my own Kickstarter. I did a graphic novel with that. Um, which was a tremendous amount of work and my first child had just been born. Um, and so kind of that burned me out a little bit on comics. And then I did, um, what is it? I'm looking at the poster right now, uh, Space Mountain uh, for Disney, uh, for Disney Press. And uh, it was a lot of fun. It was a little um, like a digest size comic. Um, and like you could, it was exciting. You could go to Disneyland and get off at Space Mountain, you know, at the, not Star Tours. It was right before all the Star Wars stuff happened, but there was a little, a, you know, a galaxy vendor type shop. And so there was a big display at Disneyland of my book, which is very exciting. Um, and so we worked on a second one that unfortunately did not uh, come out uh, because they had just bought Star Wars. So I think that probably was eating up a big chunk of my comics time for the better part of a year was trying to get the second Space Mountain book done while I was doing some TV stuff um, and that fell through. And then I just, uh, you know, kept doing with the, with the TV. Uh, over the past few years, uh, you've been strongly involved in genre shows like Sleepy Hollow and Shadow Hunters. Uh, what is it about sci-fi and fantasy that attracts you? I think it's, it's interesting because like when you start out, you're like, I'm not just a genre guy. I could do anything. And now it's like, yeah, no, I could do that. Sure. I, I don't mind genre. Um, you know, and I think part of it is coming to terms with it's easier to kind of hit theme when you're when you're in genre, like in that old Star Trek -y kind of way, like as far as like social allegory or acceptance or parables. Um, for whatever reason, uh, sci fi fantasy, you know, genre gives you permission to be a little more open with those things and give, let you kind of root around in, in tone and theme, I think a little bit more than just regular drama. Um, so, so, you know, to me, even if it's, you know, vampires or it's people with bow and arrows or like, I'm on a show, uh, witches right now, motherland, uh, Fort Salem, it's on reform. It, it gives you a chance to speak to real issues in a way that for whatever reason, is is safe um I, I don't know it's very hard to describe but it i think it it opens you up because you can use the tools of whatever world you're in to help get your point across to help speak to larger themes and and larger moods and larger schools of thought that's that's fascinating uh, especially in this moment you know with all the stuff that's that's going on out there about the social movements and all those things that that still uh, it seems like a lot of times we have to kind of hide our commentary in and dress it up to disguise it in science fiction and fantasy well and it's not even i mean i think with some of it it's it's not even a matter right. of 
kind of hiding it, it just gives you permission to do it. You know what I mean? Like, I know there's been lots of like comics gate arguments and stuff, um, you know, about keep your, keep your politics out of my comics. And like I, I, across all media, I think if you don't have a point to what you're saying, then you just shouldn't be saying it. So, you know, I, I'm, I fully believe in using, you know, whatever you're writing as a position paper to get across X. Um, and so, so I think, you know, with genre, with comics, with all of that stuff, it's maybe even more so in comics a little bit too, because it's drawn. So it's, your brain processes it differently. But I feel like, you know, having a soapbox is good because it will make your writing better and it will make, it makes it sharper. It makes it more focused. What am I trying to say with this versus smashing dump trucks together and hoping people like your smashing dump trucks together. <laughs> Now, Sleepy Hollow lasted for four seasons. Uh, Shadow Hunters lasted for about three. In comparison, Smallville was on the air for ten seasons. Even Netflix seems to often cancel shows after only two or three seasons. Do you find it's become more difficult to have a long-running show on television? And, and why do you think that is? I mean, it's a good question. It depends on the on the platform, I guess, a little bit, right? Like, you know, SVU has been on for a super long time too. Supernatural has been on for a long time. It's God, it's 14 years. I think Supernatural's in season 14 by the time they finish um, after the pandemic when they air in the spring. But um, with a lot of stuff now um, you're in and out. It's super short form. It's what I was on a show called guilt that was on free form and went for a pilot plus nine. I think a pilot plus eight. No, must, I think it was a pilot plus nine. Um, and wound up not getting a second season. I think because there is so much TV um, that exists now to watch, the kind of the the down the downside of that the side effect is that there is too much TV to watch. And so because people's attention is spread thin, then kind of attendance numbers and viewing is spread thin. And you know, Smallville had millions of viewers for a while, which kind of built up. It's uh, its ability to keep going for a bit because it was, you know, uh, lucrative financially, you know, for for the studio. It was, you know, a good home for everybody who was working there. I think long running shows can do that. It's just harder now to get to a point with a show where you can be long running because it's just not it's not the environment. It's not the current climate um, for going through it because people can be so fickle now. Especially if you're like a what Umbrella Academy, right? Season two just came out. How long was it between season one and season two? You know what I mean? Like it's, <clears throat> I liken it to, uh, you know, reading a book, you know, with the binge watching where you waited for like four years for this book to come out and then you burn through the book in two days. And then when's the next one come out? <laughs> Still waiting. <laughs> um, but there's, there's a relationship that's not necessarily formed with the streaming bingey stuff that I think you used to have by watching your long running shows one night a week, every week, then you'd be off for maybe eight weeks during the summer. Then you'd get new episodes again, um, maybe 12 weeks, depending on when you ended and when they started the new season back up. But there wasn't, um, it wasn't as, as flingy, that's even a word where you have this wonderful weekend with a brand new show and then move on with your life and have many, many other wonderful weekends with lots of other shows for the next you know, year to 18 months until that sailor comes back to port. And then maybe you're not going to be able to make the magic happen, no matter how handsome that sailor is when they come back. Um, but it's, um, I don't know why I went to the nautical place, but I did. Um, but but I think that's I think that's a big part of it too is that people are just at least as of right now used to getting it all done kind of at once. I think that's why like Mandalorian was um, it was great. Like my kid and I, like my seven year old, we watched it together on Friday nights. It was our thing. Like we went and sat down, and that was a first for us. Like he had never had appointment viewing, you know, of that form before. Yeah. Um, and so he kind of, at first he was like, what do you mean I can't watch them all at once? Like, <laughs> okay, sit down, little one. This is how TV used to work. But it was, it was nice because we forced us to slow down and sit down and co-view and watch together um, and made each episode we were watching that much more special because there wasn't another one to watch after that. That was it for that week. 
Um, so I kind of I kind of wish more stuff would go back to that. I know some people complain when Hulu rolls things out slow or I think HBO Max is doing them in clusters with like little bits and pieces with like three episodes here, three episodes there. But um, I don't mind it. I like it. Yeah, I, I watched uh, The Mandalorian Friday morning at 6 a.m. before going to work, so I couldn't wait. So. <laughs> but uh, now we understand that you probably can't say much about this, but we noticed that you were named story editor for the new He-Man and the Masters of the Universe cartoon coming to Netflix. Is there anything that you can tell us, anything you can tease about the show and how you got involved? Uh, no, unfortunately, because of, <laughs> I have to be that NDA guy, but because animation takes so long and we are so far out. Um, but what I can say is it, it looks amazing and it's, um, you know, another one of those co-viewing things, which I'm excited about. Like there is definitely a very big um, tonal difference between the, the Kevin Smith continuation of the old cartoon, which is, you know, there are two He-Man cartoons on Netflix right now. Um, there's the Kevin Smith show and then there's mine, which is not the Kevin Smith show, but there is, there is mine and ours. I mean, there's so many great people involved and so many great voices and we just got another new great voice, um, that I can't talk about yet, but talk to me in after the first of the year, then maybe we'll finally be talking about this out loud, but let's come back around to it. Yeah. We'll have you back on the show then. How did that sound? That sounds fantastic. Let's let's come back around to it when they finally allow me to speak of it. <laughs> so what what's next for you? Any other projects besides He Man that you've got uh, cooking up right now uh, that you can tease for our fans? Uh, I mean, we're still we're still going strong with the you know with the He Man stuff, um, and we've got a bunch of people helping with that. And then um, on the second season of Motherland Fort Salem, show about the military witches on uh, on freeform um and you know season two you know was picked up but i have no idea when i mean who knows when anything's going to shoot at this point but um we're we're pretty we're pretty far in, in in getting season two put together for everybody so that's that's what's cooking right now my wife is a massive fan of that show so i've got good news for her when i stop recording nice nice yeah no it's yeah, <laughs> it's it, it's yeah, it's not a secret. It came, I think they they released that news kind of right after the pandemic hit. I think they said they were picking it up for season two. Um, but it's it's fun, man. It's a wild world. It's it's this guy Elliot Lawrence who created the show. He did a, a a great job of just just this massive sandbox of of stuff to play with. That again, like we talked about with the social commentary, like there's a lot of room in there, especially with current events. With you know. Uh, you know, witches and people who don't have powers and civilians and, uh, you know, a woman's place in the military, but it's flipped and it's an AU where, you know, predominantly women are the military. So what's a man's place in the military? Like there's a lot of interesting ways to vector in on, on social commentary with this one. So it's, it's fun. Well, there you have it, Brian. Thank you so much for joining us today. This has been an absolutely fascinating discussion. Oh no, gentlemen! Thank you, thank you so much for having me. It's uh, it's a pleasure. Sorry we had to reschedule so many times. If uh, if you're listening, we had to reschedule a few times. Spoiler alert! But we're here now, so thank you, thank I, you, David and Chris. We're we're so excited. Uh, none of that matters. It happened. Well, I hope your students both appreciate you guys. We are we are very detail oriented, and and uh, we we make it happen. So so thanks again, Brian, for your time, and and best of luck with with all the projects that you're working on, and we can't wait to see what what comes in the future. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you very much. All right. Next up, after our final break of the episode, we're going to hit you up with some nerd commendations. Stick around. <laughs> All right, Chris, we're back, and it is our final segment of the show. We're going to recommend you some nerdy content. What do you have for us this week, Chris? Okay, so I'm going a different aspect of my nerdery, okay? I've, I've previously referenced the fact that I'm also like a psychology nerd, um, and my recommendation this week is a show called 100 Humans um, on Netflix. It was released March the 13th of this year. Um, and basically what it does is it takes a hundred human beings, go figure, um, and they're part of like this social human behavior type of experiment. And they cover just about everything. There are three hosts that serve as like the, the people administering all these experiments and stuff. And it covers everything from like what makes us attractive 
what what are people attracted to um what's the best age to be alive um the 100 the 100 humans are divided up um into age groups like their 20s 30s 40s 50s and 60 on up and so like for the the best age to be alive episode um they they get furniture from ikea and then they have to be blindfolded and then one person has to communicate with the other teammates so then like what age group does that the best or whatever um um and then they in the third episode they have like the battle of the sexes so that's always interesting i mean that's a tale as old as time the 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 most powerful episode i would have to say if you're going to watch one episode of this show you're like okay chris i'm going to watch this based on that based on your recommendation watch episode four are you biased and i know what you're thinking you immediately jump to oh racial bias here we go again sjw stuff but it's so much deeper than that it does tackle racial biases um there's there's like a tear jerking activity where they have like um like you're shooting blanks and you have like a, a white man pop out of a vehicle and a black man pop out of the vehicle. And then, you know, I'm sure you could surmise what happens there, but it even tackles further biases on people with a lot of tattoos biases for people who are young people who are elderly. Are you biased against, you know, is there age bias? And it's, it's super interesting and things that I never thought about took for granted um there's also an episode on pain versus pleasure if that can be a motivator um but yeah it's just a fantastic show that i just happened to find um based on a recommendation from my wife and um it's just really great and i highly recommend it it's just really interesting when you it makes you really kind of like second guess like hmm why do i act the way that i act so it's it's just a really cool show and for all those psychology nerds out there i highly recommend it yeah, so this show completely f- flew under my radar. I had never heard of it. And I consider myself a bit of a Netflix aficionado. So I'm kind of surprised I didn't even ever see this. Uh, the premise sounds so interesting. And I can see this providing some serious entertainment value. Uh, the, the, the historian in me is like, eh, I'm not sure how much it can actually prove or actually predict about human behavior given the small sample size. But still, I'm, I find it a fascinating exercise, and I'm definitely up for something like this. Yeah, absolutely. I, and I can't believe I forgot to mention this in my opening, you know, cell. It's hilarious. Like, you'll never stop laughing. So, like, I, I, I would guess, I don't know, I haven't looked at the credits, but I would guess that the three hosts of the show are comedians in their own time. So it's incredibly funny. Like, there's cut scenes where they explain, and they actually talk to actual psychologists and professionals as well. So there's some, some facts behind it. So I, I understand where you're coming from. We're both, we're both fact-minded people. So, um, so, so rest assured there, my friend. Uh, Dave, what do you got for us this week? Ah, we need to talk video games because my heart is still broken. I've made no secret on this podcast about the fact that Horizon Zero Dawn is probably my favorite video game of the generation. I sunk about 100 hours into this game. I sincerely wish there would have been more. I'm hyped that there will be a sequel, but there's no release date yet, and I am still looking for something to play. So in the meantime, I've been looking at a whole bunch of different games, I've tried several things, nothing seems to quite scratch the itch of not having Horizon Zero Dawn to play anymore. The game that has come closest so far, though, is a spin-off from the Far Cry series called Far Cry Primal. It was released in 2016, was developed by Ubisoft Montreal, and published by Ubisoft itself. The game follows the story of Takar, who lives in uh, 10,000 BCE, and rises up from a simple hunter to the leader of his tribe. Missions include gathering tribesmen, protecting villagers, taming wild animals to fight alongside you. There are some definite parallels uh, with Horizon Zero Dawn. A big open world, lots of side missions. Um, It's first person instead of third person, uh, but it has at least uh, somewhat similar mechanics. Uh, Now, I've only dabbled in the Far Cry series before, and I have been told by several people that a lot of the skill tree and the map itself in Far Cry Primal is basically a rehash of Far Cry 3. Now, I haven't played Far Cry 3, so all of this is new to me. And the setting 
of this game uh, is absolutely fascinating to me. So I'm really enjoying it so far. Um, it's kind of pulled me in. Now, don't get me wrong, it's it's nowhere near as good as Horizon Zero Dawn as far as polish and, and the like, but there's just enough parallels there that I'm going to probably stick with it and see how far I can get in it. Well, I can I can definitely second your emotional goodbye to a video game because I'm I'm finishing up the st- well I finished up the main story on Red Dead Redemption two, so now like I'm taking two weeks. Uh, it's been two weeks and I still haven't finished the epilogue, so I'm I'm taking my sweet time. Like I will play for like twenty minutes and I'm like, nope, I can't do it. So then I'll go read comics or I'll watch a show or something. So I've got you know I got no small list of things that I'm I'm working on right now when it comes to nerdy content. But yeah, so I totally understand that. But I, I have n- no exposure to any of the Far Cry games, but it looks really cool. Like, you know, even with the game art, it, it, it draws me in. The other Far Cry games, maybe not so much, but if I dig this one, um, yeah, for sure. I know we've, we've had our our issues with Ubisoft in a re- recent episode, but um, they made Assassin's Creed, and I love I love those games. Um, so if it's made by the same company, it, it's, the skill tree kind of rings in my ear to some similarities with, with Assassin's Creed, so maybe there's some similarities there, but I definitely want to check this one out, and if it tickles you know my fancy, then maybe I'll look at the other ones too. Yeah, the other ones are more traditional, I think, you know, first-person shooters, whereas, you know, having having the variety of weapons here, you know, dealing with, with spears and with uh, bows and arrows and clubs, it's a, it's a very different experience than, you know, using some kind of sniper rifle in a video game. There's definitely something a little more intense and a little more visceral about this particular setup that I find really interesting. Yeah, that, that definitely draws me in you know being the history nerd that i am like that was one of the biggest appeals for assassin's creed for me was um using swords and you know using spears and and like you said bows and arrows i i it even like on i want to say it was like assassin's creed 2 or 3 when they introduced like this handheld like bow thing that like shot from your wrist i was like nope that's too close to a gun i don't like that um and then they had a similar thing with assassin's creed syndicate where they you had basically had this revolver built into your wrist and i was like no nah, I've, I've not not a fan i like the old school stuff so yeah definitely you know speaking my language there yeah yeah i'm right there with you all right folks that's it for another episode of the nerd byword podcast thanks so much for joining us If you enjoy our podcast, please give us a rating or review and subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. We're available everywhere podcasts can be found. You can also find us on Twitter at NerdByWord or individually at ThatNerdChris and at ThatNerdDave. You can also catch us on Instagram where we have a fantastic uh, community of comic book love and fans. Um, You can find us at nerd by word you can also find us individually at that nerd dave and at that nerd chris dave is still a baby when it comes to instagram i'm trying to nudge him ever so slightly but um yeah we also have ever since episode four going on we have full episodes uh on youtube as well now those are just audio so please don't be disappointed and crushed when you don't see our glorious faces um on those on those posts but we are on youtube so if if you're like me i open youtube to play music when i'm like washing dishes or cleaning the house so so do that so go ahead and open youtube throw on an episode of the nerd by word um and and you know clean house but um thanks so much guys for joining us another week we really appreciate your support um just stay well and stay nerdy the Nerd By Word is produced by two nerds, Chris and Dave, to encompass all aspects of the nerd multiverse. The theme music was written by Al Jimenez. Our show art features original art by Ashby Design, as well as public domain comic panels. Find us online at nerdbyword.com, on Twitter at nerdbyword, and send questions and comments to nerdbyword at gmail.com. <laughs>